And my first speaker is Fazam Ishani from The Foundry and he's going to talk about the changing nature of money and how it is impacting the world. Can we please give Fazam a warm hand of applause? Um, uh, once again, my name is Farzam Ishani. I am the blockchain lead at The Foundry, which is the fintech unit at Rand Merchant Bank. Um, so I've been asked to say a few words today about money and kind of how it's evolved over time and what the next stage of money is and how it's impacting our world. So I think the first thing I'd like to ask is, is really to ask you guys what your conception of money is and for you to think about that because you all have rands in your pockets. You probably have a rand account somewhere with some bank. Uh, and when was the last time you sit, sat back to ask yourself why the rands in your pocket actually have value. At the end of the day, it's a piece of paper. Uh, there's a government institution that's kind of given it a stamp. And, uh, and this is not just in South Africa, this is all over the world. And because of that stamp, we believe a piece of paper, which is worth cents uh, at best, can buy me things that require work, like bread and uh, transportation and fuel. If we look back at the history of money, it's a very interesting thing to look at the evolution, which is about 12,000 years ago, during the agricultural revolution, cows were used as money. They still are as, as assets now, but in the past they were used as actual money. But as you can imagine, uh, it's, it's very difficult to trade with cows. You can't say, I'll buy that for, uh, for two cows. The next question comes, well, how big are your cows? How fat are your cows? How skinny are your cows, etc. So as we've moved along in uh, the evolution of money, there are a few characteristics that have played the role of money and determined what money is in our society. And I want to just go through a few of those characteristics with you. Number one is that money needs to be divisible, right? The smallest unit of money needs to be worth the most worthless thing in our society, okay? That's why cows weren't very good at that. Cows are worth quite a lot. Number two, they need, it needs to be durable because if you have money that's meant to be a store of value and it doesn't last very long, then that's also not very helpful. Number three, it needs to be fungible. Now, this word fungible means it's interchangeable with anything else. So we talked about the cows. You can't say that one cow equals one cow. Lots of questions come about the cow. But you can say that a 100 rand note equals another 100 rand note. It doesn't make a difference which 100 rand note you have. So that's fungibility. Then probably more importantly is portability. How quickly and how easily can you transport your token of value, your money, to someone else? For much of humanity's history, money was something physical. And what that meant is that it limited interactions and transactions between people that were in your physical proximity. Or you needed to load something onto a, a donkey or something like that and, and transfer it over to them. So portability is a big thing. Number five is scarcity. Anything that's not scarce doesn't have value. And think about probably the most important thing to all of you today is oxygen. Yet neither, none of you pay for the, for the luxury of breathing in the oxygen because it's perceived as abundant. It's not something scarce. And then lastly, and most importantly, the number six is acceptability. Now, I want you again to think about the money that you think about when you talk about money and the, the cash that's in your pocket and the money that's in your bank account. And for you to realize very explicitly that your money, the acceptability of that money, is determined and restricted by a plot of land that we call a country. 
Another, another assumption that I'd like to put into your mind a little bit is that we take it for granted that money in our societies is issued by a central intermediary like a central bank. And it's that way and it's worked many way in, in many societies it's worked very well. In certain other ones it hasn't worked very well. And some of you or all of you will be, will be uh, familiar with this concept of KYC, know your customer. And we view that as something that we need to have as society. But what if I told you about KWYCI, which is know where your client is. And imagine that regulation stipulated that not only do you know, need to know your client, but you need to put a tracker on their car or on the person to know exactly where they are at all times. How would you feel about that? Not, not too many enthusiastic heads. Nodding. <laughs> the reason I bring that up is that the idea of money up until now, well, our recent history, as I said, has been associated with the central bank. It's never been like that before. When you talked about cows, central banks didn't issue cows. When you talk about gold, central banks didn't issue gold. When we talked about animal hides, when we talked about salt, when we talked about the other shells that we've used in society, the idea of paper money that's issued by a central intermediary or authority is something very, very new in our society. And what cryptocurrencies are doing is actually re-evaluating that and actually saying, well, wait a minute, we're in a world that's global today. And when I want to transact with somebody else, is it not possible that I do so quickly, efficiently, and cheaply, even though they are in another country that is determined again by our man-made borders? So in the future, in my humble opinion, in your lifetimes, there won't be any of you that will not put up their hand when asked, do you use cryptocurrencies? It's a very new concept. It actually challenges a lot of your thinking, as I said, about what money is. I highly, highly encourage you all to invest a little bit of time to understand what this is all about. Um, Yoko is a company that uh, myself and uh, three of my co-founders founded in 2013. And I think at that stage, it was really like us trying to sit and come up with an idea that we could do together as individuals. So initially, it was my three co-founders together, and then I came in there after as well. So for us as Yoko, as a company, one of the most important things we wanted to have in place was we wanted to be able to make decisions ourselves on who would become a Yoko customer and who would not. And this for us was important because when you're coming into a market like this, we felt that the biggest problem when it came to credit card acceptance was not the technology. There were a bunch of interesting technologies offering credit card payments, and there was some really cool stuff that we felt we could do, but the biggest problem that we felt we needed to solve was a challenge of access. The decisioning frameworks that were currently existing in the industry didn't allow for the average small business to get access to credit card payments fast, really easily, and without requiring a long trading history. So it was like key requirements we had in place for what we wanted to have before we'd start the business. It was it has to be able to be something that someone can get today, sign up today, and have it within three days. So unless we can get that requirement done, we're not going to start this business. You know, it has to be so easy for any business to get. You don't need to have had a business for long because as a new business, we feel like the difference credit card payments work, make to a new business is, is really big. You go from accepting cash to a new business, we've seen such astronomical growth Companies growing by 80% from the day they have saved credit card payments. This doesn't happen to every business, but we've seen it happen to a lot, and it's so amazing to see. So for us, it was like, we have to have this in place. And that meant that we spent a year talking to various banks around South Africa, trying to get an arrangement where a bank would understand the processes and the procedures that we were putting in place, and understand that we had a good way of vetting businesses that didn't require them to have trading, like trading history. So that was kind of the idea, and it meant that we spent a year really putting together documentation, pitching our business. Probably one of the hardest parts of any business is when you're a year in and your business has not started, but you haven't earned income. So like at, 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 towards the end of that year, we had those like serious doubt moments, but 
kind of, because there were four of us, and I think we only survived because there were four of us, there was always one person who was like in a good mood when everyone else was doubting. And that meant we could always pull each other together and kind of call, no, no, it's gonna happen, it's gonna happen, we're gonna find a way to do this. So we got to pretty much the end of 2014 and we finally, finally got an agreement in place. Uh, Mercantile Bank decided to take us on as a, a client of theirs and allowed us to actually onboard customers without them having to have, obviously together we put in place a framework, but ultimately they allowed us to become a super merchant which meant we could onboard our own customers directly. And I think as any business knows, you transition from the beta to saying you're going to scaling, it's not as easy as that. Um, you launch your business, you go out there with a bit of raw, but you have to get customers engaged and interested. So that's what we did, scaled up the marketing. Over the course of the next year, reached about 5,000 businesses. Um, and you know, that was kind of really like driven by, I guess we tried to be very innovative in how we market our product and how we made sure that people knew that we were out there, knew that we could vet them. And I think one of our biggest things for us was that at the end of that year, we had about a 90% approval rate on the customers that applied. Um, so this was really important to us and something that we're always trying to get up. At this stage now, we're sitting at about a 97% approval rate, so we're still trying to get it up higher than that. But basically, I mean, over the course of this year, once again, we've been pushing really hard and, you know, earlier in the year, we reached a milestone of 10,000 customers and we're now finally at about 12,500 customers. Um, at the moment, we have offices in Cape Town and Joburg and I think what's, what's been great for us is just kind of like, building a good product, uh, making sure it's a high quality product and releasing it into the market and just watching how the South African resp market responds to high quality products. I think during the early days of uh, raising capital, there were often people across the table from us who would be like, I'm not understanding why you're gonna run a beta for so long. If the product works, just get it out there, you know? And it's almost been great just to like really focus on giving South Africans a high quality solution and almost be vindicated by the customers coming back and saying that's exactly what we we're looking for and allowing us to kind of move ahead of any competition at that point in time. So that's kind of been one of the, one of the most interesting parts of this journey and something that we, we knew from day one was important. We had a lot of challenges around that. A lot of people felt that like, you know, you know get it out there fast, kind of move fast, break things, etc. And, you know, that wasn't the approach we decided to take. Uh, we just felt that the the customers we were dealing with, especially SMEs, are so used to being given like the last, like the dregs when it comes to products that we wanted to be different. We wanted to be the guys who gave them a product that went over and above what they needed and continuously like exceeded expectations of where businesses were at that point. So that was sort of our primary drivers uh, within the business. Um, the other thing is that, which really motivated us to get into the payment space is none of us as founders of the business came from the payment space. And you know, during the early days, it was always a challenge because we didn't understand the space, but it felt that it gave us a sort of a fresh eyes perspective on payments, something that we felt hadn't been done in a while in South Africa to say, let's look at everything in this industry with fresh eyes and try build it from the ground up. You know, so take a first principles approach, challenge every assumption that we saw, and really build a business that wasn't based on the status quo, but was based on fundamentals that we agreed with and principles that we thought made sense for the industry. So, you know, that was one of our drivers during the early days. And I guess this was stuff that came out for us during the fact that we had a year to kind of figure it out while, while trying to kind of get the arrangement with the bank in place. But when all said and done, to kind of look back now and we're really glad we've taken the journey in this, in this kind of manner. Um, it's been quite exciting for us as a business. So, yeah, I mean, I, I think just to give you a little bit of background on myself, because I skipped that a little bit. Um, so I was previously in another venture before uh, co-founding Yoko. So this is like my second outing out, uh, something that I never thought I'd do. I kind of thought I was gonna do one business and stop there. Uh, I originally co-founded a business called uh, Yego. We did a mobile voice of IP back in the days of like, gee, it was like in 2005 using Symbian phones and Windows phones before the iPhone existed. And we're once again just trying to do something innovative in the industry. So coming out of that and coming into this was really exciting for me obviously a little bit nerve wracking because you know, it's, it's quite a nervous journey the second time around because you've kind of made a bunch of mistakes the first time and your goals are very different from uh, the first time. I think the first time around my goal was not to fail. This time around starting a business my goal was very different. It was not not to fail but to not have a business that wasn't like super successful which is very different to not failing. I think it's obviously as every entrepreneur you kind of start your business and you don't want to fail but it's a different thing when you say, I don't want to not fail, I want to really succeed, and I fear not succeeding, you know, building an exponential growth company out of it. So I think that's kind of been what's been driving me this time. It's been great to have people and partners who are aligned the same. So yeah, that's a little bit about kind of the story of Yoko. Uh, 